Hi. So what I'm going to tell you today is that when you play a major chord on piano, it's actually out of tune. Any piano, every major chord, it's actually out of tune. Listen. Do you hear it? Okay, so you probably don't believe me. The notes are the notes, right? Um, so what I'm going to say is that the notes are actually all in tune as individuals, but as a chord, they're out of tune with each other. Now this is a concept called just intonation, or also known as mediant tuning. And when you say median in like uh, the classical music realm, a median is the major third of a given note. So C, your major third is going to be E, A, your major, your median is going to be C sharp. So why is this? Um, this sounds silly. Uh, what we're going to talk about today is we're going to go through the math and science of just intonation and how it applies to musicians and then importantly, how it applies to audio guys like us and why it should be more important. Um, so first, let's do the math. Let's take A440. It's a nice round number, and you'll have to forgive me. My eyes are here because I'm reading a script, so I'm not going to memorize all this. Uh, 440, of course, is the number of hertz, meaning you get a positive and negative pressure of the sound wave 440 times per second. An octave lower A would be 220 and another octave lower would be 110. So let's use A110 as our fundamental pitch. Now we're gonna listen to it a little bit, so soon here in the video, we're gonna be down at 110, so if you're on your phone, on your laptop, you're probably not gonna hear that because those speakers don't reproduce 110. So now, um, if you're familiar with the harmonic series, the harmonic series is all the notes that resonate sympathetically with a fundamental pitch. Most instruments naturally resonate all these upper level harmonics at varying volumes, and collectively, these resonating pitches formulate most of how we characterize an instrument's sound. So within the harmonic series of A, 110 is our fundamental. We have A110, A220, E330, A440, C sharp 550, E660, G770, and A880. The pattern should be pretty obvious here, we're just adding 110 every time. And so now let's open up our handy dandy notes to frequency chart. Okay, here's A110 right there. You add an octave, another 110, we're at an octave A. You add another 110 and we're at E330. You add another 110, we're at the octave A again. 440, and you add another 110, and we're at C sharp 550, but this is actually C sharp 554. So that's 554 is significantly sharper than 550. So we have a problem, um, and if you want to if you want to do the math on any any chord, any fundamental, you, you can. You can start at C and do the math, and you'll find that this holds true for all 12 major major chords. So that brings us to the question, why does it matter that the major chords need to line up with a natural harmonic series? So the short answer here is dissonance. And in audio language, dissonance is kind of like phasing in a harmonic way. So to explain this, let's get interactive with my recording software here, over here. I've recorded a sine wave, um, and this is our fundamental pitch, A110. I recorded it off of my phone, like just a little signal generator. And we've got a C sharp 554.4 and a C sharp 550. So the 550 is the natural resonating frequency above A110. C sharp 554 is what it is on a piano. Makes sense? Follow me? So let's zoom in here. Let's get it under a microscope. We'll see we have a beautiful, beautiful sine wave. That looks like it could only be made by a computer. Um, and let's take a look. So when you measure waveforms, you always measure from the 
peak. So let's look at this. So there's the peak of our 110, and then you see our 554 and the peak of our 550. So you count them, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, that's math, basic math, makes sense. Now go here to our second, second one, grab it. You can see the 550 is lining up just right. 554 is just off, just a hair. You know, and we're, we're looking at micro fractions of a second here. We'll go to our third wave. You can see it's off a little bit more. 550 stays right in sync. So let's have a listen to these. Zoom out. Okay, take a listen. Now that's the 554. Now let's listen to the 550. It's a little bit hard to hear if there's dissonance. But you can see how that C sharp 554 sticks out more than the 550. It doesn't blend as well. Um, it's sharper and it sticks out of the texture. So I went, went ahead and did here was I rendered the two out harmonized together. So here we have the A with the 554 and you can see all kinds of ripples. I won't make you listen to it again because you just heard it. So these ripples are happening because the lowest common denominator of the 554 is not the same as the 110. They don't share the same mathematical thing. So what we have is hills and valleys not syncing up at exactly the same time. So that causes phasing, which is what people perceive as dissonance. So you can see that the 554 is mathematically, scientifically out of tune with its fundamental A. And we go here with the 550, you have just a perfectly flat, in tune waveform. Um, and this is huge. I, um, just, just, oh my gosh. You can see how nice and even, one, two, three, four, five, you know, every time you, know, you zoom in the other one, you know, it's, it's off, it's not quite symmetrical, you know. So, so, th so this is what happens. And, all right, so let's move on. I'm gonna get back to the script here. Um, so in case you're wondering if this actually applies to more than just two notes over two octaves apart, let's test it with a real life instrument. So I happen to play the trombone, which is, you know, it's got a slide, so you can do little micro adjustments in pitch. Um, I'm a little off my game, so uh, I hope I can play in tune. I'm gonna go with a B flat just because it's easier. So let's see. I gotta make sure I record it here. Record arm. Mute. 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 Okay. So so bear with me here a second. Mm. All right. Here we go. So here's a B flat. I'll try to make it perfectly in tune. <laughs> D, just regular D like you'd hear it on a keyboard. Now I'll lower that D just enough to be in the natural harmonic series of B flat, so it should be perfectly in tune. see if it works okay stop recording um, let's see if we can split these clips split let's move these move these okay solo this with this 
All right, let's have a listen here. So you can hear just a little bit of fuzziness or dissonance in there. So let's try this. One more time. Go back to the first one. So you can see how that first one, the one where I was playing sharper, is not quite in tune. So there you have it. All right, so now let's move on. So I hope that now you are mathematically and scientifically convinced that this can be information worth retaining, but this begs the question, why was music made to not be in tune? So for that, we can blame this guy here, this guy here, Johann Sebastian Bach. You know, he's around the 1730s. Before Bach, organs and accordions and stuff still had all 12 chromatic notes, but they were tuned much differently. An organ, per se, could only correctly play songs in one or two different keys, so the notes were tuned mediately in just intonation, like I've been explaining, around a very specific key, kind of like a harmonica. So when you would play the major chord that the organ was tuned around, it would, it would sound perfect and it was beautiful. But almost every other chord sounded awful. And I've heard recordings in music history class, but I don't have one for you here. It's, it's interesting. So in the early 1700s, Joe Hain Batch was the first dude to really make use of this new system of equal temperament, um, which it was the hip new mathematically standardized way to make all 12 pitches evenly spaced across the keyboard. So this way you could play any song in any key on any instrument and it wouldn't sound awful. So Bach flaunted this innovation in music with his set of tunes called the Well-Tempered Clavier, Clavier's German for piano, and he would cycle the same song around every key signature pretty much just to show you that you can play any key on instru any instrument and it will sound right. But of course from then on all keyed instruments lost that whole median tuning thing. So these days, it's not something you will find a piano or a guitar player thinking about often. So let's come back to today. And so here's the secret. For classically trained musicians, this whole thing with median tuning is common sense to them. It's something that they are taught to play all the time. So I know that Every one of you music school buffs out there that's been watching this has been rolling your eyes the whole time because I'm saying something obvious. But this knowledge isn't, it doesn't seem to be, it seems to be more of a secret when we're outside the professional musician sphere. So a musician knows that every time they play a major third, they need to lower that pitch by 13 cents. Yes, 13 cents just like that. So a cent is a percent of a note, as in adding 100 cents to a note will get you up to the next one. So if I go up 100 cents from A, I'll be at B flat. If I go down 50 cents from A, I'll be at the quarter tone halfway between A and G sharp. And unfortunately, not every instrument can raise and lower their pitches as easily as some. The instruments that do it best are violins, cellos, violas, contrabasses, trombones. What these instruments have in common is their notes aren't locked into a particular set of keys. It's just wherever they put their finger on the, on the not fretboard, whatever that thing is called, or wherever they put their slide. So they have absolute control over their tuning. And of course, this also applies to vocalists, which is what us audio engineers spend the most time auto-tuning. Now, a talented singer with a good sense of pitch, even if they aren't classically trained and they don't know anything about this, they will automatically adjust their pitch of their major thirds to match the chord that they're in. 
and that's simply because a major third feels in tune when it's lowered by 13 cents. So if you, if you ever hear a good string quartet, a good trombone quartet or a chorus, you'll notice how pleasantly consonant all their major chords sound. And that's because they're listening and they hear, they automatically adjust those pitches down by 13 cents. Let me get this hideous thing off here. Just, there's some reading for you. It's all on Wikipedia, so I, I feel less intelligent compared to Wikipedia. Let's see. So, as audio engineers, what we need to do is be careful that when we go to fix pitch, we don't botch what is actually good musical intonation and kill a nicely tuned major chord. We can't put the notes on a grid and say that a note is out of tune because it doesn't technically match the standard pitch. We have to consider the harmonic context of the note. Now, I don't expect every audio engineer to be able to recognize the role of each note in its respective harmonic context, but I think the question needs to be asked before fixing the pitch, does it sound out of tune? And if it doesn't sound out of tune, then it's not out of tune. So, so just leave it alone. The, the other thing to consider about this is that if you do tune your major thirds to be on a grid, that that will cause a slight bit of dissonance, the phasing. And as you saw in the waveform, um, that increases the volume of your harmony. And you might want that, but that dissonance is going to cause your levels to be more volatile, and it's going to take away your overall headroom. So it, it is something to consider. But, I mean, you do have to weigh that with, like, if, if you're in a band that's more driven by piano and guitar and instruments that are fixed on a pitch, you might just want to tune the vocals right to standard pitch. So use your discretion. And we've got a little bit of more food for thought. So your guitar, it's mostly tuned in fourths. E, A, D, G, mostly fourths except for the B string. And you ever notice it's super hard to tune the B string when you're, when you're tuning by ear as opposed to a tuner. So you play the G and then you play the B string, and if you tune it by ear together like that, what you're doing is you're tuning it medium. You're doing a medium tuning. Then you go to play your B on your G string and match the B open B string, and now it's out of tune. And that's all because of medium tuning. Ew, try it. Try it. Um, so that's why it's important. Just, just tune your guitar to a tuner. It's, it's difficult to just use your ear. So there's going to be a part two of this video, and I'll get a little bit more in-depth into this. And unfortunately, it gets way more complicated. You might have noticed on our pitch chart earlier that E compared to A is, where was our E330? E330 is not actually at E330. So that means, yes, you need to raise an E by like two cents or something. Um, and also your minor thirds actually need to be raised 15 cents. So the minor third is the most difficult sort of pitch to for a musician to tune on the fly. And just everyone knows that. There's minor, minor thirds are difficult to tune. So, but I'll get into that more on part two of this video and I'll go into more complex chords how to tune those like major seven chords, minor seven chords, extended chords with uh, six different harmonies and how out of tune those notes actually have to be in order to make a consonant sound. Um, so thanks for watching. I hope you got something out of this. Um, just don't auto-tune everything. Just auto-tune the things you need. That's my opinion. All right. Thank you.